If you look at the title of this class, How Can I Build Up My Marriage? Assumptions I Make. You got great marriages. You just want to have better marriages. None of us have perfect marriages. And so any of us, including the guy who's up here in front of the class, could sit and take some notes on how to have a better marriage. But since I'm going over this material several times before I teach it, then I'm having to hear it several more times than you do. You just have to hear it once. And uh, none of you are saved to your spouse. And mine's sitting back there behind Jeremy and Ashley. So I'm, uh, uh, I've got a fact checker, just like uh, uh, Mike said tonight. All right, so the idea behind this class is how can I build up my marriage? We're going to look at several different qualities over the course of the several weeks that we have. Um, we might not have a chair problem next week because I'm going to give you homework in this class. And so we'll probably only have eight people in here next time. But uh, uh, I'll give you the homework assignment at the end of class. But what I'll, we're going to start tonight with what you see right here. How can I build up my marriage? Our first thing we'll look at is be happy. Sounds simple enough, doesn't it? Let me ask you, how many of you want to be happy in your marriage? How many of you want to be unhappy in your marriage? If I have to get a raise your hand, I'm just kidding. We all want it, right? We do. So let me ask you this. If you were to try to just poll people that you come across, and you were to ask them what makes for a happy marriage, what kind of answers do you think that you would receive? Maybe you've heard of it before. Okay. It's a marriage that I'm happy if I'm in a marriage where there's communication. Now, you, you're, you can't help but look through the prism or the worldview, the paradigm is the big word, of the Bible and Christianity. But I want you to think in terms of, you go up to John Q, Jane Q Public, and you ask them, what makes a marriage happy? Lots of money. Money, okay. And, and these aren't bad, but these are just the answers we get. We're not going to judge it necessarily, but the things that we would expect to hear. What else? Honesty. Honesty. And I'll tell you something, John and Jane Q Public want honesty in their relationship. What else? Faithfulness. Alright, faithfulness. Let me, let me do it this way and fill in the blank. I would be happy in my marriage if blank. If it had this. Share the work. Okay. Um, <laughs> so there's a lot of different ways to put that. Partnership. Um, Cooperation. Okay. What else? Is that it? You got this? You got a happy marriage? Excitement. Spark. Romance. Romance. <laughs> That's the one. <laughs> All right. Anything else? All right. I think it's a good start. We'll we'll build on that. Um, so the way I had it here was, what do you think people think makes for a happy marriage? And, and some of the same answers you gave, but maybe some other ones. Absence of conflict. If there, if I don't have conflict, it's a happy marriage. Getting my way. No, you, they're not going to say that, but maybe what they're that's the way they feel and live. A great sex life. Having a lot of children. Having no children. Freedom from financial stress. A lot of responsibility. Not a lot of responsibility. Now, some of these are factors that can make a marriage better, right? Some of the things, many of the things you mentioned here will make for a happy marriage, but some of the things that John Q and Jane Q are going to say aren't going to do it. They're misguided. They don't really have the right source to help them to get to the bottom of that. Um, but some are looking for an easy magic formula that will automatically yield a happy marriage. If only it was as easy as following steps 1 through 47. Now, is there a, there's an Ikea somewhere around here. Y'all familiar with Ikea? Um, you might like, it. am I too loud? Just a little bit. I'm not, uh, <laughs> it's, it's the person on the back half of the classroom. I, I understand. Not, no, it's okay. Thank you. All right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to say, I'm going to say that stuff. Can you hear me? Uh -huh. See, this ain't going to work. <laughs> I don't know how we're going to work this out. Um, and I forgot where I was. Well, I've never been reprimanded by my son. I'm going to use Ikea. Ikea, yeah. 
So you may be, a, I'm not necessarily a fan of Ikea, um, but it you know, comes in a box, and you take it out, and it's got the, the paperwork. Ever try to put it together? We got these Adirondack chairs, uh, and uh, good, good price on Amazon. Um, put together a greenhouse, all pictures, there's no instructions. That's a lot of fun. Kathy and I, and, uh, you know, it's about this time of year, 2004, uh, I had started, uh, I'd started running back in, in 98, and that was doing a little bit, but I wanted to get in a little better shape. And so I decided to go in those wider gyms. J.C. Penny or Sears used to have those. That's a German company. They were really, you know, um, plenty of words. I pulled out the instructions. Just one of those three tiers, you know, where you have the two sides in the center, and you have the pull downs, and you have, you know, the, all the different things. It's 320 something steps, right? As I recall. Uh, talking about a marriage builder, <laughs> We're, we didn't divorce through that. It was it was great. Um, about halfway in, about step one fifty something, in the middle, we are looking at the instructions. We're reading the words and we're looking, and it's it is the a place where you do that pull down. There's a pulley, and the directions are wrong, and we can't figure it out. And let's just say the words got a little tense between <laughs> husband and wife there. And we could, because, I mean, you're halfway. And, there, and you've got to get this thing done, and it's New Year's Day, right? <laughs> so I get in the car, and I drive up to the store, and I go in, and I look at the store display. It's put together. And as soon as I see, oh, yeah, it makes perfect sense. Drive back to the house. You know, and we finally got to the, the end of that. Um, we just got, for, for Christmas, we got, and have you ever gotten a puzzle of yourself before? It's pretty cool, yeah. Um, and it's a wood puzzle, and it's great. Love it. It's pic my favorite picture of Kathy and I. Um, and the the pieces. You ever have those where the pieces look like they fit, and then you put them together? We're gonna find out. All the guys are going sure, Neil. We always put together puzzles. No, I, you, uh, you ladies, baby, I know how that goes. I don't know. Maybe you help, guys. But the puzzle pieces seem to fit, and then they don't. And then you mess up. Now this one has, is great because on the back side it has A, B, C, D, E, and F. So if you're putting a C and a D together, even though it looks like they fit, they, they don't. Don't you wish that it worked that way in marriage? That if I just, if I had all the pieces of the puzzle in the box, then I'll be happy. Things will, will be great. Does it work that way? D does it happen in marriage that if we can just get steps 1 through 47, just fit just right. I'm not talking about what the Bible has to say about that. But sometimes we look at trying to be happy in marriage that way. And a lot of times what we're looking for is what somebody else can do for us in our relationship in order for us to be happy. Now, I do believe happiness and building up marriage goes together. The two ideas are synonymous, but the question we've got to answer is what does it mean to be happy? If you don't get anything else, I, I want you to, to hear the answer that we give to what it means to be happy in your marriage. Because a lot of people aren't getting the right answer to that, and so they're frustrated that there's not happiness in their marriage like they want it to be. We've got to be happy with our marriage in order to build them up, but that means at least three things. And so that's what you have in front of you tonight that we're going to look through. Number one, happiness is a choice. It's a choice. William James, the noted Harvard psychologist, said this, The greatest discovery in our generation is that human beings, by changing their inner attitude of their minds, can change all other aspects of their lives. Do you believe that's right? That if, if you, by changing your inner attitude of your minds, can change every other aspect of your life, if you start inside of yourself, if you choose that way, I'll give you an illustration. Victor Frankl was a Jew who was in a concentration camp. He spent some of his time at Auschwitz. He survived. And he wrote some of the most touching books about that as a survivor that were ever written. And he talks about what it was like to be a, uh, a, a prisoner in that concentration camp. And looking out the window and looking in those smokestacks and seeing... They, many of the Jews understood exactly what was going on, and they saw the ashes, and they knew that the, he knew that that was their friends and loved ones, and he said it was something to look around and to see how prisoners would fight one another just for string to wrap around their feet. He says it was something to see fellow prisoners who, because they despaired of life so much, they threw themselves on the electrical fences instead of trying to live anymore. And he said something there I thought that really was 
was vital to what I'm talking about tonight. He said, the one thing most needed by despairing men was a change of attitude. He said, we had to learn for ourselves and we had to teach the despairing men that it really didn't matter what we expected of life. It was what did life expect of us. He said this also. He said, the last great human freedom is the ability to choose one's attitude in any given circumstance. Now, you may have been in a marriage class before, but you ever had a teacher use a Nazi concentration camp as an illustration? <laughs> Somebody found him a hard time for that, but here's the point. If he could choose happiness in those circumstances, can we choose happiness when things aren't as great as we want them to be in, in married life? There may be days or stretches of time when things are going wrong in your marriage. In fact, let me say it strong, more strongly. There will be. I don't care if you look at somebody else and you think they have the most wonderful marriage you've ever seen. They have those times, those stretches, when it's tough, when things are difficult. You may feel distant from your mate. You may have had an argument or a series of arguments. You may have problems in the bedroom. You may be under financial duress. You may be struggling with issues with your kids. Now, I've often mentioned in premarital counseling and sometimes in even marriage counseling that all marriages are going to encounter problems in five basic areas. Every marriage. What do you think they are? I don't know if I've, I talk so much, I don't know if I've said this in the pulpit or what, but I don't think I have. What are the five problem areas of marriage? Money. Money. And we can talk about that. Too much, not enough. A wrong focus, wrong priority. Uh, who manages it? All kind of different things. But money is a, is a problem. What else? Communication. 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 All right. I have it memorized in my mind in a certain way. I, I'm not going to tell you the acronym or you'll figure out what they are. <laughs> you will anyway because it's all marriages deal with these things. Communication. Did you know this is the number one reason why couples go and seek counseling? It's the number one stated reason. 90% of all those who go for marital counseling help go, at least this is central to it. Doesn't necessarily mean that the husband and wife aren't talking to each other, but the communication is not healthy. They may be talking at one another. They may be using poor communication skills, but it's a, it's, it's a problem marriages go through. What else? Parenting. Okay, I put that one, to, I say five, I kind of meld these together, so it, maybe you can see the connection. One of the problem areas of marriage, I put sex and children, obvious connection there, but um, sometimes, and we'll talk about this in other lessons, about this disparity in philosophies of child rearing and so forth, and those types uh, of issues. We'll talk about all of this as we go through. Two more. Okay, some of these, so things like priorities and trust are what I call bleeding principles. They, they can hit into all of these areas. Okay. Yeah, and I would say that something like that history, another way to put that, would be one of those bleeding principles. Somebody's passion with money, somebody's passion with communication, so forth. In laws. In laws. Now, you love your in laws, but some people, they have some trouble with their in laws, right? I remember something my dad told me. When I, I was growing up, and the, and the girl I was dating at the time, I, I'm glad to, to have had that analogy. I love my in-laws, by the way. I, I, I'll say that freely. But he said to me, son, you don't just marry the island girl. Have you ever heard that? You marry the island, right? And, of course, you can think about the different problems. In-laws in who are kind of intruding, us letting in-laws in, all of that. Okay, so one other area. Okay, um, I would put that one down here into this area, but it's definitely something that, that not every marriage deals with, but some marriages with, for sure. That's it. Her Let the record show Harold was going ahead and saying this before I wrote it down. Religion. Now, that, uh, that's obvious if one is a member, of, uh, is a Christian and one's not. Can that be a problem if both are Christians? Sure. How so? Difference in spiritual maturity. Right. Uh, um, all of these overriding principles can come into that. Um, a, a different. Do I, am I just a member of the church, or am, am I a disciple of Christ who lives it every day? That, and that and that shapes the decisions we make in our home and the happiness we feel in the home. So, 
Here's the thing. You're going to struggle on these fronts, is my point. Do you know there are going to be some times when you're dealing with multiple of these? There may even be some stretches in your married life where you're dealing with all of these at the same time. Can you be happy in those circumstances? Is it possible if you're working on a solution to those? Absolutely. But happiness in your marriage is a choice that you make. Abraham Lincoln said people are about as happy as they choose to be. But I suggest to you that someone said that long before our beloved 16th president, and that was the Apostle Paul. In Philippians 2, 12 and 13, he says, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but also much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who is at work in you both to work and to will of his, to do His good pleasure. So here's the question. Do you will to do His good pleasure? What about in your marriage? Do you will to do His good pleasure in your marriage? You know, the prodigal son first came to himself, and then he went to his father, and then he, he had that discussion. Remember, what did he say? When he's been in the far country of sin, he's been eating pig food, and then he, the Bible says he came to himself, and then he said something. Anybody know what he said? The first thing out of his mouth. It's okay. It's not a Bible uh, quiz. I will arise, and I will go to my father. And I will say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven in your sight, and so no more worthy to be called your son. He had to get his will involved before he could get to a happier place. Is that sometimes what we need to do in marriage? Do we need to get our will involved? Do we need to choose before we get there? He'd been pursuing his selfish wants, and it had landed him in misery and unhappiness. And the key to his finding happiness was repenting and returning to the Father's house and his rules. And this is a principle that helps us in our marriages. Our issues may not be immorality or sinful conduct that has done damage to our spouse, but we may be wallowing in the mire of self-pity concerning the state of our marriages. If that's going to change, we must will to make it so. My only point is, it's an attitude. It's a choice that we make. Happiness is a choice. All right, number two. Happiness is a choice to be selfless. How many of you guys ever heard of Abraham Maslow? Maslow? Caitlin, you know, what's, uh, what's Maslow known for the most? The hierarchy of needs. Okay, all right. So put your further on the spot. Kind of what is the hierarchy of needs in a general sense? It's just what a, ba a human basic needs that they need to survive. And if you don't have certain needs met, you can't worry about the other needs the pyramid and the hierarchy. That's a great explanation. So hierarchy suggests what? Rank, rank. Ranking, right? Priorities. Priorities. Now, now Maslow makes a great point. This goes even beyond priorities. These are essence items. These are essentials. Things, and I can't remember all of them, things like safety, um, uh, freedom from abuse. Um, you, you know, I, I think it's even, I don't know if food and, and shelter uh, maybe on that lower tier as well. And then you get into some very important things. Then you get into some things that are, are more and more esoteric that are, are less essential. So you know the guy. You've heard of, maybe you've heard of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. There's basic things all of us have got to have to survive. Now the same Maslow that came up with the idea of the two types of love. And I believe he's onto something. I think he's tapping into a biblical idea here. And those two types of First of all, is what he calls deficiency love. Deficiency love is basically selfish. It's based on the needs the other person can fulfill. The other person is frequently regarded as an object and not as a subject. So here's how that plays out typically for a man who experiences or is trying to experience love through this deficiency love model. He loves a woman who gratifies him sexually. He loves a woman who glories in his achievements. A woman who is subordinate and dependent. Who turns to him for guidance and advice. Who takes care of his needs. See, she is the object that's going to bring happiness into his life. Okay? All right? For the woman. She loves a man who provides for her. Who satisfies her sexually. Who makes all the important decisions. Who makes life adventuresome. Now... As a byproduct, these are great things. But as the, the driver, in other words, I don't feel loved if you don't give me those things, he contrasts that with what he calls being love. And the being love is the love for the very being of the person. It's love that's given without reciprocation. 
But the, the, the interesting thing about this kind of love is it's so often reciprocated. So in other words, man says to his wife, I, I love you because you're my wife, because of who you are. And I'm going to give you love, not based on, it's not going to be I'll do this if you do that. Or I'll do this when you do that. I'm going to love you, matter of fact. Because, well, from a biblical standpoint, because we understand that's what God wants us to do. Now, what we see in that is that a person doesn't love another person in order to feel good or to gain status among peers, but out of the joy of personal and relationship growth. So, here's the question. How do you know what kind of marriage you have? Now, here's some questions to ask. Do you feel the need to control your mate or to be controlled by your mate? Do you see in your mate somebody who will never or should never say no to you who will do what you want without complaint and fulfill your every need? Do you see your mate as somebody who can take over your life completely and keep you from thinking and, and making decisions on your own? So the best choice that you'll ever make, surprisingly, is, is not focusing on pleasing your mate. And it's certainly not on pleasing yourself. But when you choose to make Christ the focal point of your marriage, you invite happiness into your marriage. And when you do that, you put the happiness of your mate before yourself. And that's going to increase your own happiness. All I can say to that is try it and see if it doesn't work. I think sometimes we've misused the passage, so I want to make sure that we understand it right. Philippians chapter 2, verse 1 through 4. The Apostle Paul lays down some principles that's good for us to keep in mind in marriage, and he gives the greatest example. In verse 1 he says, Therefore, if there's any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind, let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness or humility of mind, let each esteem others as better than themselves. Look every man not on his own interest, but also on the interest of others. Now, I think it gets our attention there with that. Because that's not how the world thinks. You know, John Q and Jane Q public, they're never going to give you an answer like that. But the Apostle Paul, moved by the Holy Spirit, does. And then once he has our attention, he grabs our emotion. Because what does, if you, maybe you turn to Philippians 2, after he makes that statement, do you know what the Apostle Paul does in the very next verse? He gives us an example. It's kind of when you're a kid in Bible class. If you, if you ask a question, what's the answer? Always. Jesus, right? You yes. should feel safe in that one. Jesus is the example. You, you, we know those verses very well, right? Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. This beautiful example, we praise Him now because He left everything in order to, to give everything for us. He emptied Himself of everything that He was to come down here and to do it for us. We say, how wonderful that is. But you think about what a cost it was for Him in order to do that. We praise Him now, but what did it cost Him in order to put our interest above His own? In a, in, a, in a word, everything, verse 6 through 8, gives us these specifics. He served. He humbled himself. He became obedient to death. I want you to consider some tangible ways you can show selflessness in your marriage. All right. Wives. And, and you're speaking broadly. You, don't have to, you, know, you can be as autobiographical as you want to or not. What does your mate do or say that makes you feel happy? Wash dishes. Wash dishes. <laughs> it's as simple as that. You thought it was some kind of geometric equation. But washing dishes makes your wife feel happy. Now, guys, please, take notes. <laughs> and keep in mind, you'll get your chance in about three or four minutes. All right. Wash dishes. <laughs> Make the coffee. That's biblical, right? <laughs> Hebrews. Right? Okay. All right, what else? What does your mate do that makes you feel happy? Might as well get your answers in because the guys are going to give you about 50. So, what else? The guys don't sit around thinking the mystery of a woman's mind is so complex. And you've seen, it's been a few years ago, about the, about the woman's mind, you know, it's all these little tangles, and, and the guy's mind's a little box with one little, little mouse running around inside there, you know. We're, we're not as complex as you are, so you can really help us out. What makes you feel happy? What can we do to make you happy? Y'all are easy, please. 
<laughs> Here, let me help you get the babies. I knew you might get stuck a little bit. How about, I'm not saying it is, <laughs> ask your opinion in front of others. Would that make you happy or, I mean, in, in the right context? How about compliment you? Is that okay? Are you all right with that? Can you, can you live with that? Unprompted remembrance of special days. It's really not that romantic if she sends you a text and said, did you forget our anniversary again? And then you come home with the anniversary again. All right. Treat your kids kindly. Support you when you try something new. Now, these are answers I've collected in the past. So, guys, you might want to write one or two of these now. Hugs and kisses for no reason. Is that all right? Is that, and anyway, does that make you miserable? Am I on the right track, at least? All right. Compliment your motherhood. Praise with you, and it's his idea. Excited to greet you in the morning and evening. It's representative at least, right, isn't it, ladies? Is that some of the things that you, you believe would contribute to your happiness? Y'all are so stone-faced. I don't know what you're trying to hold out. <laughs> but come on. Is, am I right or am I wrong? Okay, thank you. All right. I felt pretty good about it, and I go, I see this, and I just don't know what I'm... All right. All right, husbands, what does your wife do or say that makes you feel happy? Here's what guys were thinking right now. They gave two answers. There's no way we're getting through. She's become a very good cook. Uh, counseling sessions, uh, like, uh, what I heard him say was, she cooks those excellent meals for me. That's it, all right, okay. Are you saying she what? <laughs> Since she was six. Okay. Yeah, so yeah, it's been a long process. All right, what else, guys? Okay, just for no reason, just kind of out there, and this, this makes a day. See, they, this is our veterans of um, 40 years up here telling us that. <laughs> Text and calls out of the blue, no, no big reason. All right, I put that in his mouth, but I think that's what he meant. What else? That's two. Okay, that's fair. All right. Goes on a day. <coughs> Understands your stress load at work. Picks out, irons clothes. Shows interest in sex. Listens to you vent about work. Thanks you for providing for her and children. Greets you warmly in the morning and evening. Unsolicited physical contact. Says words of affirmation. And we'll get into this in a later time. I obviously don't have time about for it now. You guys are somewhat familiar with the love languages. How, how many of you uh, are familiar with Larson's uh, five love languages? Okay. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about that. Different things says happiness, says love to different people. And I'm, I'm hitting on some of those. Now, your list is a couple of them as an individual is going to be very unique. But there are certain things that you want and that your mate wants. Tune into those. Happiness is a selfless choice. What we so often do is we want our list to be filled instead of work on our mate's list. And when we do that, we find ourselves uh, happy. Now, in the few minutes I have left, Happiness is a choice to be content. Let me let me deal with that just very quickly. Um, we're conditioned to expect happiness and we feel like we're passive in the process. In other words, you've got to make me happy. It's not how it works. Paul wrote this. He said, I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. Y'all familiar with that passage? Somebody give me the context real quick. He's in, he's in prison. All right, so... Think about what Paul had been through in Philippi. He had been falsely accused. He had been beaten. He had been thrown into prison where he was shackled hand and foot. He was put into the inner prison. But what was he doing at midnight? Singing. Acts 16 and verse 25. So I think we can give him some credibility here. He, he knows what he's saying when he says, I've learned to be content whatever the circumstances. If your heart is right with God, you can be content whatever your circumstances are. Until you're able to be happy in every situation, you won't be happy in any situation. It's true. So how can you choose to be content? Three things. Number one, believe you can. Paul wasn't able to be happy by himself. How, did, how was he able to, to, to be happy? What, you know what he says two verses later after I've learned to be content in every circumstance? The passage sometimes we misuse, but it's one of the most familiar passages of Philippians. I can 
Do all things through Him or Christ who strengthens me. Paul believed that Christ could give him the strength to be content in whatever circumstance his life threw at him. Keep this in the mind of marriage. Number two, pick content role models. They're hard to find in our current culture. Nobody's content. We want more. We want bigger. We want better. And it's not just about gadgets and cars and phones. It's about marriages and relationships too. And so we've got to pick those role models that are content. Look at happy marriages. Don't envy them with seething resentment. But, but examine them and try to imitate them. Remind me to tell you, I don't have time tonight, about Bill and Joanne Sharbine. A great example of a couple that we knew early in our marriage. It's even, they're a verb now in our home, and I'll explain what that means later. Your buddies at work, or high school, or college, the parents whose kids play on your ball teams with your kids, your neighbors or even your church friends with uh, rock, rocky and unhappy marriages can infect and infest your own attitude. You don't even know what's happening. And social media has become a big driver of all of that because we think they have it all, and we don't. And we look at them as our role model when really they're not the best role model. So pick good ones. I, this may be as far as I get, but I want to make sure you get this principle. You can look at content role models in Scripture and in the context of marriage, don't we often talk about Habakkuk, the prophet? The great marriage teacher? Never heard it in my life. Habakkuk 3. Real quick, Habakkuk, he's frustrated the prophet because the enemies of God are prospering and they're the ones bringing down the people of God. They're more wicked, but God's using them to punish God's people. And he wants to know why. God gives him an answer. And chapter 3, real quick, is his shigia note. It's his song of, of, of saying, I get it, God, and I trust you. Here's the last two verses. Though the fig tree may not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, though the labor of the olive may fail, and the fields yield no fruit, though the flocks may be cut off from the fold, there's no herds in the stall, yet I will rejoice in the Lord, I will joy in the God of my salvation. Here's a 21st century adaptation. Though I've been laid off and my unemployment benefits ended yesterday, though my in-laws moved in today, though my wife and I just can't agree on this issue, though the flame of love is flickering, Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. You, you find those good role models. Can I take five minutes next week to finish this and then move into the next week? Yeah. Okay, good. Because I really got one other thing I want to say. Homework. You thought I'd forget this the second bell run. What I want you guys to do is to work up your list of three things that you have got to tell your spouse that they can do to make you happy. That's tough, isn't it? Now, all I'm going to do next week is ask you if you did your homework. I'm not going to ask you to share it with me. But I want you to take the pledge that you're going to do that. <laughs> ask each other. And bonus points if you hug and kiss as soon as you're done with that. All right? In other words, I don't want this to be a fight between you. I want you to, but I want you to communicate those things. All right? That's it. We'll, we'll pick up here next week.